Welcome to the GCN Tech Clinic. You know the score by now. Send in your questions using the hashtag AskGCNTech and uh, we'll answer them as best as we can. No Ollie this week, just me. He's presumably at home reading science books. So uh, we'll go straight into our first question. First question is from Peter Matson, who says, I'm a road rider, but I'll be going mountain biking with some friends in a few weeks and it has him wondering whether to use road bike gear, whether that was appropriate for mountain biking. So is his road helmet safe for trail riding or does he need a mountain bike specific one? Also, plans on wearing his road bike kit because he doesn't see any obvious advantage to mountain biking kit. What, what's best to use? Yeah, go for your road bike kit. I don't see a problem with using that. I tend to wear my road bike kit when I go mountain biking. The only downside is it's not quite as robust as your mountain biking kit. So you do run the risk of snagging the corner of your jersey on branches and brambles and stuff like that. And also, it doesn't have the option for any padding, so it doesn't offer much protection if you crash or anything like that. And in terms of, what else was it? The road bike helmet. Yeah, I wear my road bike helmet on the mountain bike. It should be fine, providing you're not gonna do any crazy stunts and jumps and stuff like that. Then you might wanna consider a specific mountain bike helmet. On to our next question, which is from Jack Smith. He says, how often should you get your bike serviced? Um, I've done nearly 9,000 kilometers since November 2020. Is it time for a professional strip down and check everything? That's quite an open question, because it really does depend on how well you maintain your bike, how often you ride it, what conditions you ride in, all sorts of things are gonna change the variability of this and everyone will have their own preference. But my suggestion for the most cost-effective way of doing this is to get it serviced once a year at a bike shop. So full strip down, clean check everything, and then do that after you've ridden in the worst weather conditions that you're riding. So in the UK, that would maybe be March time after winter has passed. And then you've got a bike that's set up perfectly working for the nice weather in the summer. Once the summer's passed, you can just give your bike a quick check over. It's worth doing that every month or so, but you can do that yourself. In fact, I've actually made a video showing how to give your bike a quick safety check. Um, so it's worth checking that out and you can save yourself some of the costs of going to your bike shop. But once a year for your big annual service, you should be fine. Next question in is from Callum McGregor, who says, I have a wheel on turbo trainer and I've just bought my first disc brake bike setting up a turbo only rear wheel with the appropriate tire solely for use on the turbo trainer do i actually need to fit a disc rotor to that wheel and what would be the drawback of not bothering um no no need to fit a disc rotor on the wheel if you're only going to use it for the turbo trainer the only drawback with not doing that is if you accidentally keep pulling the back brake so gradually you're going to push the pistons of the caliper out and they'll close up and when you take your bike off of the turbo trainer you might struggle to get your disc rotor in but it's a simple case of just using a flat headed screwdriver or a tire lever to carefully push the pistons back into the caliper and if that is something that you're concerned about you can just easily add in one of those small plastic spaces that are quite often supplied with your bike when you get it new and that goes in place of where the disc brake rotor goes and will um, stop the pads from pushing out so that keep it nice and simple right on to our next question it's from jan crocken who says hi when i put road bike tires on it's often almost impossible to find the rotational direction marker is there a reason it's often barely visible and is there a trick to knowing what direction a tire tends to go without looking for the marker um yes so if tire, if a tire has a tread pattern on it the ideal situation is to get it rotated in the correct way around you can just search for that on the sidewall of the tire, but like you say, it is written quite small. And the reason for that is because it's not actually the most important factor for your tire. Yes, you want to get it right, but it's not absolutely crucial to providing the best grip. So most of the grip for your tire comes from the mechanical grip provided by the compound rather than the tread pattern and the rotating direction of it. So that's why it's maybe not clearly visible. And plus, it's not that cool to have big arrows all around the side of your tire. The tread pattern, however, is particularly important on like cars, for example, because it's there to dissipate water as you're going over big puddles and stuff like that. So if you can find the markers, get the right way around. If you can't see them, try to angle the arrows facing forwards and you'll be fine. Next question in is from GR Alex, who says, are clipless pedals stronger than flat pedals? I like riding uphill and I push the pedals really hard and as a result of this, 
I've snapped a lot of pedals in a short period of time. So what pedals would we recommend on a small budget? I can't say I've ever really heard of many people snapping pedals, um, especially when you're riding uphill, but kind of what I did want to know, you haven't actually said whether you're breaking the pedal body or the axle. Because if you're using flat pedals, quite often the body or the platform is made out of plastic and these don't tend to be very strong. Um, so it could be worth switching to a flat pedal that has a metal body because that's going to be a lot stronger. But if you're snapping the axle over the pedal, I can't say I've ever heard of that. But if you are using sort of slightly cheaper pedals that are sort of supplied with your bike when you bought it new, they tend to be fairly low quality because they're produced quite cheaply. Um, so it might be worth considering a slightly better quality of pedal. Or you could just upgrade to clipless pedals and I've never heard of anyone breaking one of those. They tend to be made with the axles that are either stainless steel or some of them are also titanium. So they're a bit stronger than the mild steel, which presumably your flat pedals are made out of. So it is worth upgrading. Look for a pedal with a metal body if you're gonna go for a flat pedal, or if you're gonna go clipless, try and get a stainless steel axle, or even better, upgrade to a titanium one, and you've got some nice fancy pedals. Next question in is from Tense, Tense, yeah, says, hi GCN Tech. Does riding in the winter burn more calories? Basically, does your body spend more energy keeping itself warm or cold? 100% yes, you use more calories when you're cold. Um, it's a proven fact. I actually looked up a couple of different studies on this, and the one I saw was about hikers. So people that were hiking in the cold compared to the warm burned 38% more calories. And the reason for this is called thermogenesis. So that's the process of the body burning more calories when it's trying to keep warm rather than trying to keep cool. So if you want to burn more calories, ride in the freezing cold. Next question is from Charles LeBenard. He says, is it complicated to cut or trim the steerer tube? He says, currently he's got too many spacers on the top. No one likes a big chimney on their bike, do they? Um, the process of cutting down the steerer is actually quite simple. You just need to remove the forks of the bike. Uh, no, actually, before you remove the forks of the bike, carefully mark up the height that you want to cut the steerer at. Measure it once, measure it twice, measure it three times. Just measure it lots and make sure you've got it correct because otherwise you run the risk of cutting the steerer too short and then you might need to get some new forks. And once you've got them removed from the bike, it's just a case of finding a good quality hacksaw blade or if you've got a carbon steerer, find a blade that's designed to cut carbon fiber and then mark it up. Use a fork cutting guide to ensure you get a perfectly good clean cut or if you haven't got that, you could just use an old steerer, clamp that onto the, uh, no, an old stem, sorry, clamp that onto the steerer and use that as a guide to cut through. You need to make sure you remove the bung from the steerer, which is where the top cap threads into, and then you can put that back in afterwards. The only time it becomes complicated is if you've got to remove the forks from your bike and you've got internally rooted disc brake hoses, because then that means you've got to open the system, remove it out from the forks and the steerer tube, and that's a fairly complicated job and something you might want to consider going to your bike shop for. But if you've got a simple bike, you'll be able to do it, no stress. Just mark it up, measure it carefully. Right, our last question is from Tyler Muna, who says, what's the difference between resin or organic brake pads and metallic disc brake pads? I'm looking at getting some new pads for my Cannondale System 6 and I'm lost with the different options and which one's better. Um, I actually shot a video about this the other day, so if you haven't seen it, it's worth checking that out as well. But in simple terms, a resin or an organic pad is fairly quiet in operation, it's not so suitable for really high temperatures, and it's a bit of a softer compound, so it won't last quite as long as a metallic one. So a metallic one is kind of like the opposite, opposite to a resin one. So you've got a material which is fairly noisy when you apply the brake, or at least noisier than a resin pad. Um, it generates a little bit more friction, so it's going to wear your disc rotors down a little bit quicker than a resin or organic pad. But in that instance, it will last a bit longer, and in terms of the temperature, metallic pads operate at quite high temperature, so they're ideal for if you're doing long alpine descents or particularly harsh and heavy on the brakes. Um, but if you want to find out a bit more about that, it's worth checking out the video, and I'll cover all of the different details of all of the different types of disc brake pads. That's it for this week's GCN Tech Click. Hope you enjoyed it. As always, keep your questions coming using the hashtag AskGCNTech and we'll try and get to them next week. See ya.